social media and uh, newspapers this week have been filled with just one topic. And I'm not talking about uh, the storm ring. I'm talking about the typhoon Napoles or <laughs> typhoon pork barrel scam. And, uh, you know, you have to be living in a cave not to sense the collective anger of the Filipino people towards this issue. And uh, in fact, one of you made this comment in Facebook. He said, it isn't just love of money that is the root of all evil. In the Philippines, love of pork barrel is the root of all evil. (laughs) I know how you feel. Some of you are angry. Some of you are sad. Some of you are throwing up your hands in despair. And, beloved, it makes you ask this question. Lord, when will this end? Up up to when will they get away with these kinds of things? Will society ever improve? Is Is this what we will be facing for the rest of our existence? You know, that's exactly the same kind of mindset the disciples had when they were asking Jesus the question that started the whole discussion on prophecy in Mark 13. They were asking, when will this happen? How will we know they're just about to happen? What things? The last days. And beloved, when you ask, when is this going to end? When will right prevail and when will wrong be punished? It comes from the same context, and here's the answer. It's not going to improve. It will get worse and worse and worse, and worse, before the best will come. That's what Jesus is saying here in our passage. It's not going to improve. Now, there might be some spikes of improvement in some setting. Maybe for 5, 10, 20 years, in a certain country, there might be some improvement. Maybe a revival or so. Maybe that could be the Philippines. A short-term improvement, but... The overall course of human history, beloved, will be worse and worse, further and further towards self-destruction until the righteous judgment of God will arrive. I'm sorry to paint such a bleak picture, but God painted that for us here in our passage to tell us that's why you must be ready. That's why you must be prepared. In fact, we sometimes ask ourselves like the disciples did, when will he return? That perhaps is not the best question. The right question, beloved, is, am I ready when he returns? So before we go to this passage in detail, why don't we come to the Lord in prayer? Lord, we've been asking the same question. When we look at corruption and graft, when we hear of massacres and gang rapes and and teenagers getting killed for a cell phone, we sometimes ask, when will this end? When will this coming of the Lord be finally true? Will it ever change? Lord, help us find the answers to our questions in your word today. You gave this to us, not so that we could despair, but so that we could prepare and be ready so that we could realize that you've given us a limited time, Father. We don't have the luxury of time because you can return any moment now and we might not be prepared. We might be sleeping. We might be sleeping on the job. Lord, let the same motive that Christ had when he spoke to his disciples the same intention, the same end. Let it have the same effect on us today. May it inspire us to be ready. May it inspire us to make our loved ones ready. Enable us, Lord, to make this message real in our own lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Twenty centuries have passed since this passage was given. And Christians have been asking that question. When? When is he coming? What are the signs? And every generation since Christ spoke these words has been thinking, 
Maybe it's in my generation. Maybe it's in my time. Because I'm seeing some signs. You know, it's good to think like that. To always expect it might happen in this generation and time. But beloved, God is giving us these things because He actually wants to stimulate you and me towards right living for this world where the Bible is belittled. He gave us prophecy not for debates in seminaries or among Bible scholars or among us. He gave us prophecy so that you and I will be given a picture of the future to help us live better today. That's prophecy. It's a picture of the future so that today we live better. And when we know, when we see the Bible being fulfilled in prophecy, then we know the Bible is true. We know God is true. The gospel is true. And we can build our life on the Bible because we can believe it. Above all, Jesus gave Mark chapter 13 to us today so we could live with the end in mind. Many of these prophecies are not yet fulfilled. Many might be fulfilled without, without us knowing it. And so that's something you should keep in mind. We might not just see it happening. But he gave it to us that we could live with the end in mind. And we should be careful. We should be careful because there are people who will always volunteer to tell you, I know what this prophecy means. I remember when I was a teenager, uh, there was a very famous book, The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. No, I devoured that book. I must have read it three or four times. I was so in, interested in it. And uh, it's the result of what uh, happens when a sincere Christian tries to be pinpoint accurate in saying, I know what this prophecy means. It will humble you. For example, he said that when the European economic community gains 10 members, at that time it had not yet 10 members, The Antichrist will arise. Well, the European Union now has 27 members. He said that the Cold War would never end. And then Russia will rise up to become the apocalyptic Gog in in the Bible. Well, you know, the Cold War ended. And Russia is not as powerful as it was before. He also said, beloved, this and that about this country, and I'm sure this is what will happen, and... Of course, it didn't happen. I wonder how the book will read today if he rewrote it. Why? Because Iran is very prominent right now in the global scene. It's not even mentioned in the book. How about the rise of North Korea? How about the global domination ambitions of China, which is becoming obvious? It's not there. So you see, when we try to be very pinpoint accurate about prophecy and say, I know what this means, 100%, God will humble us. Today we will look at these prophecies and we will look at the possible interpretations. But Christ is warning against you and me, saying we have it captured for sure. We're 100% sure we understand it. And I hope we approach prophecy with a humble attitude, realizing we may not even be aware it's happening right now. What, what happened, by the way, in our passage? The background is in Mark 13, 1 to 4. Do you remember last week when Elder Dylan preached about the highest priority of your life? The last part of it was the widow. They were actually in the temple. They were watching the widow give the last bit of her money to the offering. So they were there. They were watching. And then as they were leaving the temple... The disciples notice the temple. It's called Herod's temple. It's a grand structure. You know why? Because when Herod built it, historians tell us he deliberately doubled the specifications for Solomon's temple. He wanted to impress the Israelites because the Jews were getting restless under his term, under Herod. So he doubled the specifications of Solomon's temple, which was already a wonder of the ancient world. He tried to outdo it in every detail, and the result was a grand, magnificent, and unfinished building. So the disciples were were admiring it, and then Jesus told them, You see these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another. 
Every single one will be thrown down. And of course, the disciples were astonished by such a statement. It was a wonder of the ancient world. It was massive. It was huge. And he was saying, nothing will be left. Now, if, if A.D. 28 is indeed the time that Christ was crucified, in A.D. 70, barely 40 years after he said this, the temple was demolished down to the ground by General Titus of the Roman army. He attacked Jerusalem, he tore down its walls, he demolished the temple so completely, one historian said you could actually plant crops in what used to be the temple. If you go to Jerusalem today, you'll still see some of the foundation stones. They're massive, they're big, but it shows you how completely it was wiped out. That's Christ saying that it will be wiped out and it became true. By the way, A.D. 70 was the time that the, dis- the Jews were dispersed throughout the world. They were dispersed so thoroughly it would take May 1948 again before they could recuperate and become a nation again. That's how completely they were disbanded as a people. So that's the background, beloved. And in answer to the question, when will these things happen? I mean, the disciples got more than what they asked. They were just asking about the temple. Remember? But Jesus' answer would take into account thousands of years, 2,000 years or more into the future. So they got an answer way beyond what they were asking. And let's see now what Jesus is saying to you and me as believers. Because we will see his instructions, first of all, for fearsome dilemmas that will happen to you and me as believers as part of his answer in Mark 13, verses 5 to 13. And if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to keep your fingers there. I will ask you to psychologically prepare, by the way, for a longer sermon than usual. I'm going to tell you that at the beginning. It is hard to rush through this passage. It is a complicated topic, and I hope you have more patience than usual today. In Mark 13, 5 to 13, these are instructions for certain dilemmas that are terrible in their nature. What's a dilemma? It's a situation where you have a choice. Every Christian, we believe, will go through these dilemmas. What's the first one? The first one is about deceivers in verses 5 to 6. And the instruction for that dilemma is to watch out that no one deceives you. Jesus said, many will come in my name and will deceive many. He's saying that in the last days, which are our time, we are in the last days, there will be people who will make it their occupation to deceive other people. And perhaps you're familiar with some of them. How will you identify such deceivers? The term antichrist, beloved, does not refer to just somebody against Christ. The word anti in Greek, when we translate it from the Greek, the source of that word means either against or it can mean in lieu of, in place of. The antichrist isn't necessarily somebody who's against Christ. It's anybody who wants to take the place of Christ in any person's life. Those are the deceivers you have today. They will try to take the place of what Christ should be for you and me. And instead of feeding the flock, they will be feeding on the flock, milking them of money because, as Paul said, they are in it for personal gain, whether that's the gain of money or the praise of men. You will know them by their fruits, and part of their fruits is they make you loyal to themselves. Instead of you coming away from their church saying, I love the Lord Jesus more today, you'll probably say, I like that man more today. You may not even know you're saying that. These are the false teachers. And Jesus said, there will be many in our day and age today. And I'm glad that there's one of us, beloved, who's humble enough to say, as a GCF member, I, I got deceived. But God in His sovereignty brought me back. I'm going to ask uh, you to welcome today to the pulpit 
one of our very own members, Sister Marfe Durana, to speak about her experience as somebody who came under deception and got, how God brought her back. Let's welcome to the pulpit Marife Duran. Pastor. Good morning, GCF. It is indeed a great privilege for me to share with you my story related to the message today. At first, I was hesitant to share it because I was too concerned about my reputation. Nakakahiyamang sabihin, but I want to tell you, nakulto po ako. My story began when I left GCF in 2008. I was invited by a certain local church in Quezon City whose pastor was very much involved in the police ministry. For your information, my husband is a police officer. At first, I was fascinated by the church's huge ministry. In fact, this church ministered to a total of 2,500 policemen all over the country every week. The pastor would always invite me to speak before this policeman and would always invite me to give testimonies in their church on Sunday services. I was unaware that he already lured me into becoming a regular attendee of his church. My husband was not aware of my decision to transfer to the church because during those times, he was on a foreign mission for a year. When my husband came back, I remembered one Sunday while driving the car to go to church with my family, I turned to the left going to that local church instead of turning to the right going to GCF. My husband was, was caught by surprise and asked me, why do we go this way? I told him that he has to speak in that local church and the congregation wants to hear his testimonies. I did not even bother to ask him if it is okay with him to speak and share his testimonies in that church. See how non-submissive I was to my husband during those times. That was because I was blinded by the church huge ministry and in a way manipulated by their pastor. He was always telling us, if you really love God, you will serve him. And he was always citing Matthew 19 verse 29 out of context by saying, Kayang kaya kayong pagpalain ng Panginoon. Tingnan ninyo ako, may magandang bahay, apat na kotse, at nakaka-abroad ng maraming beses sa isang taon. I hadn't realized that these were all prosperity teachings. And the focus of his teaching was not God, but recognition of himself and recognition of the members of the church who were giving big amounts in tithes and offerings. It was almost natural for these members to fall victims to these flatteries, especially if his or her name and the amount of money he or she had given is mentioned in the pulpit. I remember one time, I gave him a portion of my husband's salary as an offering. Instead of giving the money to the church, I gave it directly to him because he taught us that offerings should be more than the tithes. And guess what? After giving him that huge amount of money, he made me one of the elders. Wow. I accepted the position because I want to belong and be recognized. I was unaware that I was trapped in a spider's web. And this spider fattens himself on flies. Customs, reputations, praises, advancement are but small games which false teachers take in their nets. He actually succumbed to the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, victimizing some of the members. But God put an end in all these things. Early last year, God exposed his sins, and I praise him 
for he has taken us out from the enemy's mouth. There were 70 of us. The first three months were hard to bear. My heart was filled with anger, hatred, and pain because we were deceived by a person whom we trusted so much. It got worse when this pastor and his cohorts filed a malicious case based on false testimonies against my husband in Ombudsman. What I felt was not hatred anymore. It was rage. I wanted to throw a grenade in their house. And to make matters worse, I was dealing with my pain and rage all alone because during that time, my husband was in the U.S. on a study grant. But God did not allow me to fall further into sins. Instead, he created circumstances which delivered me from the bondage of sin. This anger, hatred, and pain, he turned into mercy when one day, while meditating his word, I found myself crying, kneeling, asking for forgiveness from God. I wanted to see this pastor at that time and hug him and tell him that God loves us despite of our sinfulness. It was only then that I started to pray for him, that God would be merciful and gracious to him as he was merciful and gracious to me. Despite of this painful experience, I can tell you, my dearest brothers and sisters here in GCF, that indeed, we have a great God, a sovereign God who is in control of our lives. I can only boast of my Father in heaven because even in my mistakes, He is a loving Father who always brings me back to His loving arms. That He is true to His promises and that He will always fight for His children. Amen? At present, the 70 of us, members of what we call Home Church Fellowship, are undergoing Bible interpretation seminar for us not to be deceived ever again by a wolf in sheep's clothing. As it is stated in Hosea 4 verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Each professing Christian should know how to study the Bible and self-feed using the right methodologies. Also, God has provided us with people and other churches to help us in our learnings, recovery, and deliverance, and GCF is one of them. I praise the Lord for He made me realize also that Crises are opportunities for us to experience God's grace in our lives. Masamaman umabuti ang nangyari sa ating buhay. Ito ay para sa kabutihan pa rin natin at para sa kanyang kaluwalhatian. All the highest praises, the highest glory, and the highest honor belongs to Him. Thank you. Thank you, Marife. Took a lot of humility to say that. A lot of forgiveness in our heart to also forgive the one who had uh, taken so much from them, not just financially. And above all, it, uh, it just affirms to me the sovereignty of God. When you belong to God, He will make sure you return to Him. But beloved, I hope the testimony has driven home that point. There will be deceivers. They will be abundant and they'll be very, very good at what they do. That's not all. Jesus actually said, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. These are the beginning of birth pains. What birth pains? Well, he will talk about earthquakes and famines, wars and rumors of wars, and describes this as birth pains. Now, I have three children. I have a good idea about what false labor is, because when my wife was expecting our first baby, you know, she would wake you up in the middle of the night, and at that time I was going on duty at 
uh, PGH, still lacking from sleep, and I'll wake up and say, she'll, she'll say, it's contracting, it's contracting. And so you go to the bathroom, you brush your teeth, you look for your pants, and when you go back, she's fast asleep. <laughs> false labor. But the one thing about false labor is this. As term approaches, it becomes more and more pronounced. The contractions are stronger, more regular. That's exactly what Jesus had in mind here, beloved, when he said, These are the beginning of birth pains. What are these? Wars and rumors of wars. Verses 7 to 8. He said, Do not be alarmed. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. As of August 2013, the United Nations has classified 10 major conflicts ongoing around the world as major conflicts. Their definition is that there are 1,000 or more deaths per year. That includes the ongoing new conflict in Egypt and even Syria. Now, besides these 10 major conflicts, there are 34 other conflicts around the world which are killing less people, but because they've been occurring for years and years. That includes our own NPA insurgency, our own Muslim insurgency. That's part of the 34. But the number killed, number in hundreds of thousands already, because it's been going on a long time. Those are wars and rumors of wars. Earthquakes and famines in verse 8. The National Earthquake Information Center actually said that since the 1900s, when they started monitoring earthquakes, earthquakes of magnitude 7 or greater have been fairly constant. In fact, they said there will be about 17 major earthquakes a year. That's 7 to 7.9, and one great earthquake a year. That's 8 and above. But they're actually telling us they're not yet increasing. It's just that more are getting killed because we're more populated than before. About famines, they're occurring, but global cooperation has been helpful in detecting and alleviating them. All of this means the worst is yet to come. This is false labor. It's beginning. It's not yet fully there. Be warned. Then Jesus said, this is 9 to 13, you must be on your guard. There's one thing more. It's called persecution. Verse 9, you'll be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. This started in the book of Acts. It's continuing today. Verse 12, brother will betray brother to death. Children will rebel against their parents. Did you know the 20th century, the one just passed, the 1900s, was the bloodiest century for Christianity? It is estimated that in that past century, 160,000 Christians died for their faith each year. 160,000. They are sold into slavery and buried alive in Sudan. They are raped and executed in some parts of Central America and the Balkans. They are burned alive or beaten and stoned in India, Indonesia, and East Timor. They are imprisoned and abandoned by their families in the Middle East, resulting in all of these deaths every year. Today, violence against believers is still widespread on the continents of Africa and Asia. But the question is, what does the 21st century hold for you and me? Is it going to get better? The answer is no. It's going to get worse and worse. And worse, and Jesus would say, that's why be on your guard. Beloved, you must be experiencing some of this already. Don't be so naive as to say, oh, I feel sorry for them in Africa and in uh, China and so on. You could be going through some form of persecution, as Jesus said. In, in verse 13, all men will hate you because of me when you get passed over for a promotion in the office. Because you refuse to play political games. When you're in sales, you can barely meet your quota because you refuse to play hanky-panky with your buyers. When you're working in the government and you refuse to accept bribes, although you're a highly ranking official in government, and you see your wife struggling to pay tuition for your children. 
That's a form of persecution, beloved. And I hope you are are realizing, like Christ said, that he who stands firm to the end will be saved. What does this mean? Does it mean we are saved now by works? It simply means we are not saved because we stand firm. We stood firm because we were genuinely saved. If you experience persecution and you stand firm, it shows you are a believer. And verse 10 is interesting because it says, The gospel must first be preached to all nations. And this is for salvation and judgment, beloved. Is this a condition? Does it say that Christ will not return until it's done? Well, I believe so, but some Bible scholars disagree. They say it's just a prediction. We cannot influence the timing of Christ's return. For me, it doesn't matter. Whether it's a condition or prediction, the commission does not change. Go and make disciples. Teach them to obey. It hasn't changed. Beloved, Jesus said, the gospel must first be preached. Are you... Am I doing our part? But that's instruction for believers. Because you and I will go through this dilemmas. The next one is different. In Mark 13, 14 to 27, this isn't instruction anymore. It's information. And this is not about dilemmas. You don't have a choice. These are disasters. You will go through them if you are part of those who are left behind. We will look at the doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture in a while. Could we show that, please? Before we go to the passage. Uh, In the chart you see on your screen, the church age is where you and I are living right now. It began with the coming of Christ. In fact, the church began at Pentecost. We're living in that age right now. The church age will end in an event called the rapture. It is described very well in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 to 17, and in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, God will take believers home. There will be a worldwide disappearance of believers. We believe that with all our hearts. And when that happens, it will usher in a time called the tribulation period. It's seven years. Seven years divided into two sections. The first three and a half years will see the rise of a political genius who will be like Jesus Christ in many aspects and the opposite of him in many. If Christ was rejected, this man will be beloved by the whole world. He'll probably be very good looking. I'm just guessing. He'll probably be very eloquent. So, you know, I'm not going to be the Antichrist. Uh, (laughs) He will be such a charismatic leader. He will unite the whole world under him. You know, 20 years ago, uniting the whole world wasn't such a likely scenario. But with internet, with worldwide media, with on-time, real-time coverage, it's becoming a reality. Can one man really rule the world? 20, 30 years ago, very unlikely. Technology is making it possible. Three and a half years. Unite the world under one political system, economic system. There will be a boom in this world we've never seen. He is blessed, but not by the right God. By the false God of Satan. Satan will bless every effort you make. So you better believe it. It isn't just God who blesses things. He'll be supernaturally inspired, enabled. People will worship him like they worshiped Hitler. But it will be worldwide this time. Three and a half years. World peace. You know beauty contestants, when you ask them, what do you wish for the world? World peace. It will finally happen. (laughs) First three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation. He will strike a treaty with Israel, allowing them, we believe, to set up the temple again. You know, there is a, very, a, a group of very powerful, well-supplied, very rich Jews. Right now, they're existing. The organization exists. 
You know that Jews, they work together even worldwide. They are putting all their wealth, all their connections together to make sure the temple is rebuilt. These Jews do not believe in Christ. They're most likely unsaved people. They don't even realize that God said the temple will be rebuilt. It will be rebuilt, but at the three and a half year mark, the Antichrist. Beloved, now I direct your attention to your Bibles in Mark 13, verse 14. The Antichrist will break all his agreements with Israel when the temple is rebuilt and set up either an image of himself or of Satan to be worshipped. Because that's his real agenda. It's not just world peace. It's not just political or economic. The third agenda will be obvious now. The third agenda is spiritual. He will ask the world to worship him or his boss was called the dragon, Satan. That's called in Mark 13, 14, the abomination that causes desolation. And Jesus is saying here in Mark 13, 14 to 23, when you see that happening, you should be fleeing for your life. You should make sure you hide yourself in that day and time. Why? Because verse 19, those will be days of distress unequal since the time of creation and never to be equaled again. Three and a half years. What will happen? The Antichrist will unite the world. Remember, he's the leader of the world. To fight against Israel. That's one of those things that's going to happen. The other thing happening is that God will pour out the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls of wrath. They are described in Revelation. Each of them are connected to some form of punishment to us here on earth who are left behind. Can you imagine that? Here is the Antichrist trying to wipe out Israel. Here is God pouring seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls of wrath on earth. And here's the clincher. The Antichrist will hunt down like an animal every person who will display or declare allegiance to Jesus Christ as the Messiah because he wants to be the Messiah. You will not just be persecuted. You will be executed if you're a believer. It's going to be very difficult to be a believer during this time. In fact, some Bible scholars say because there is no incentive at all to become a believer, some even claim no one will be saved here among the Gentiles. That's you and me. Only Jews will get saved. I, I, I tend to think God is more loving than that. I believe Gentiles can still be saved. But it will be very, very difficult. Why? No one will share the gospel to you. Every genuine believer is gone. The Holy Spirit living in the hearts of believers it's gone. There's no one to tell you the gospel. You must have to discover it for yourself. Now, some of the Jews who get saved will become evangelists. But whoever puts his faith in the Messiah will be, will be executed for it. What I'm trying to say is that if the rapture happens and you're left behind, you might experience three and a half years of peace, world peace. But three and a half years after that, it is almost impossible for people to become believers in Christ. The Antichrist will unite the world against Israel. Israel will have many believers coming to Christ. It will have a revival spiritually. So he will even be more determined to wipe it out. He will almost succeed, beloved. And now I want your attention to be on verse 24 of your Bibles just before Israel is finally wiped out by the combined armies of the world in an event called Armageddon. That's Armageddon. Before it's wiped out, Christ will come as described in Mark 13, 24. But in those days, following that distress, so it tells you, following that seven years, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the heavenly bodies will be shaken. 
There are two theories about what this means. One theory is that verses 24 to 25 describe a nuclear holocaust. I personally favor that. But you don't have to believe that. Because uh, in the earliest days of testing the atomic bomb until when it was stopped, whenever an atom bomb was detonated, the dust will rise to cover the sky. The sun was temporarily darkened. Of course, the moon, which simply reflects the sun, is affected. The stars will fall from the sky could be a description of, of missiles launched by countries against each other, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. It's a perfect description of a nuclear all-out holocaust. But there are some Bible scholars who say, no, it's just God. It's all of God. He's just shaking the heavens. He's announcing something so important he wants to call our attention. What is that? My son is coming back. He's not coming back anymore as a meek lamb. You will sacrifice again. This time he's coming as the king of kings, the lord of lords. Look at verse 26. At that time. Men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and He will send His angels and gather His elect from the four winds. He will rescue Israel from its planned annihilation by the Antichrist. He will also, of course, destroy the Antichrist, and He will gather all believers, Jews and Gentiles, who came to faith in the tribulation period. There will still some be left. That's why it says it will be shortened. So that there will be some left. Otherwise all believers will get killed. He will gather them for the millennial kingdom. Which you see there beloved. The millennium. That's a thousand year literal reign. With Christ in his glorified body. Ruling over earth. But let's not get carried away. By the excitement in that. You know what the most important point here is? You're not supposed to be. In the tribulation period. You're not supposed to be there. You're not supposed to be left behind. You're not supposed to be left behind. Or the, lo- the ones that you love. Why? Because you will experience. The wrath of God poured out on this world. And if you ever come to faith in Christ. You will die for it. Or suffer for it at the very least. I really agree with those who say it will be very, very difficult to become a Christian. There's no incentive. You've got everything to lose from a worldly standpoint. In fact, Revelation says when God pours out all of those things, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, seven bowls of wrath, men will not be turning to God. They'll be hiding in caves and mountains. They'll be cursing God. You honestly think if you're left behind, you'll be one of the exception? Beloved, I say this in love. Don't be left behind. It will be almost impossible for you to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and tell Him, I believe in you, because it will cost you everything. I'm pleading with you right now. If you're not sure that you'll be part of Those that Christ will take up in the rapture, make sure. Take his words and believe them. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can be rightly related to God without him. Take his words and believe them for what they say. Turn to the Lord Jesus and tell him, Lord Jesus, I've not taken you seriously That commitment thing was just too radical for me. I couldn't give up my lifestyle. But now I realize I'm wrong. Forgive me. I ask you, Jesus, to be my Savior and Lord. Will you please do that today? Will you please not go home today and say, I have more time. You don't have time. Because you don't know when it will happen. The rapture, beloved. Is never predictable as Jesus has been saying all along. And I hope you or those you love will not be part of those left behind. It is just a time too terrible to be in. And it's almost impossible for anyone to come to Christ 
So why delay and wait for that? Finally, this is the third and last section of the passage we'll look at. Jesus would simply reiterate his message at the beginning, giving inspiration for faithful discipleship in Mark 13, 28 to 37. He would use two lessons here, being the master illustrator that he is. The first one is the lesson of the fig tree. He's actually simply saying here, as predictable as the fig tree in showing its leaves before summer, once the sequence of events begins, started by the rapture, you can be sure Jesus Christ will come in that generation. The second coming of Christ will happen. His visible return for believers will happen right after the rapture. It's certain. It's 100% sure. That's why he said in verse 30, I tell you the truth. This generation, that generation that saw the rapture happen, will not pass away until all of these things have happened. A generation is defined, by the way, by historians as 30 years. In less than 30 years after the rapture, you will see Christ return. And to make sure, his disciples, who by this time, can you imagine how the disciples were? And I can just imagine. Uh, I'm putting myself in there. They were perhaps shaken. They didn't know what to think. I mean, the description of the tribulation was mind-blowing, and maybe they were already thinking, how will we know what kind of stability will we have? So he says, verse 31, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. I'm going to shake heaven and earth. God will show himself as God. Christ will return, and all of these will happen, but what God has said, what Christ has said, will never pass away. You know, I find affirmation in the way we were raised and taught here at GCF or the way we handle the Word of God in that verse. You see, it's the easiest thing in the world, beloved, to ask you, what do you want to hear? What's your favorite topic? Oh, Pastor, I want to know how to, how to, how to. And I will just string top verses under those topics. It's easy to do that. It's easy for me to insert my own agenda there. It's easy for any preacher to make you love him rather than the Lord under such teaching. But if you believe what Jesus said, that his words will never pass away, you study the Bible itself. You let it speak for itself. And then you ask, how does this apply to my life? And that's what I learned at least from verse 31. But because no one knows that they are not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father, Jesus concludes the fig tree lesson by saying, Be on guard, be alert. Why does Jesus not know? Because in his human form, at that time, he limited the use of his divine powers. Of course, he knows now in heaven. He's the one who's going to return. He knows. But I hope you get the lesson here. Do not believe anyone who'll tell you, you know what? I have run all the numbers. I have computed them very well. I've studied the Bible. Remember Harold Camping in 2011? I remember that because it was all over Facebook. May 21, 2011. Uh, a few months before that, even believers were asking each other, is this true? May 21, 2011 came. We're still here. He said the rapture will happen. So he revised it. He said, that was a spiritual rapture. Uh, yeah, you remember? He said, October 21, 2011, that's the physical rapture. Christians will be finally removed from earth. Because, by the way, he's a Christian broadcaster. So you know what happened? October 21 came. We're still here. Unless you've been left behind. <laughs> Well, it means I've been left behind with you. <laughs> you know, in fairness to that man, in March 2012, he admitted in a public statement he sinned in predicting, despite the Bible saying no one knows the day or hour. And I believe in my heart. I'm optimistic perhaps he's a true believer who was sincerely wrong. But I hope you get the point. 
don't believe them when they say they know. Because Jesus said no one will know. And that's the lesson of the unexpected master. Jesus said it's like a man going away. He leaves his house, puts his servants in charge. Who's that? It's you and me. Each with his assigned task. What is that? It's not just the ministries in GCF. I hope you're not one of those people who say, I'm not a member of GCF, so I cannot participate in the ministry. Or, uh, of the so many ministries in GCF, I do not fit. It doesn't matter. GCF is not the only source of ministry. You have your workplace. You have your school. You have your home. I promise you, if you have a ministry there, even if you don't have a ministry inside GCF, you will not lose your salvation. GCF is not the only place to do ministry. You can reach places no pastor can ever reach. Beloved, each of us has an assigned task. And the master who has gone is telling you and me to keep watch. And verse 36 says, if he comes suddenly... Do not let him find you sleeping. Do not let him find you sleeping on the job. Not doing your assigned task. It's up to you to find out what that is. And then he reiterates to say, What I say to you, I say to everyone. Doesn't that strike you as strange? Jesus knew we would be studying it today, August 25, 2013. What I say to you, Disciples, I'm saying to GCF on August 25, 2013, watch. In closing, beloved, we spend months planning for a wedding, sometimes a birthday, or, or the coming of a baby, changing a career, a speaking engagement, buying a home. Do we place the same importance on preparing for Christ's return? the most important event in our lives? But pastor, what about (laughs) Napoles? Will we ever have justice here in the Philippines? Going back to that topic. Beloved, it's not our job. Our job is to pray that justice gets done. We shouldn't even judge. We don't know who the real guilty people are. Maybe it's all of those senators and congressmen. Maybe it's some of them. We don't know. Not here to judge. But I hope in your anger or sadness about what's happening, I know it doesn't help. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Why? Because God wants you to look for the best. The best is yet to come. But the question is this, when he returns, am I ready? Are you ready? Let's pray. Even so, come Lord Jesus. We hope, Lord, it's during this lifetime we have that you return. Could be today or tomorrow or next week. But Lord, if you delay and it happens when we're gone in the lives of our children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren Lord in case you delay your coming will you Lord enable us so that those who come behind us like that song says find us faithful that's all you're asking Lord that we are not sleeping on the job you've given us to do that the assigned task you've given us are being done, that we reach out to those who do not have the same faith yet and realize if they are left behind, it is almost impossible for them to get saved. It will be very difficult. So whether for ourselves, Lord, or for those we love, if we have come to faith, help us share the gospel, Father. And help us be certain of ourselves. And help us to be faithful and obedient to you today. Enable us, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.